Welcome to the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show. I'm your host, Dan Breslin, and this is episode 135 with Nick Prefontaine on positioning tenant buyers in a rent-to-own deal. You probably remember the Prefontaine name from when Chris, who is actually Nick's dad, came on the show recently and discussed terms real estate deals, that is, getting into deals with little to no money of your own. Nick works in that same business and handles much of the buyer side of those transactions. Uh, a lot of people talk about and even teach these no money deals, including rent to own. But the reason I've had so many of the pre property solutions, that's the uh, pre Fontaine family's company name guys on my show is that these guys are actually doing these deals and actually making money doing these deals. Uh, make sure you pay attention to the buyer process that Nick and I discuss a little later in the episode. That's the real jewel of wisdom to be found on this show. Let's get it started. All right. Welcome to the show, Nick. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome, Dan. How are you doing? Doing good. So I'm sure some of the listeners probably recognize the Prefontaine name from your dad and some of the other uh, people in the, the office and the click, the team there coming on the show here. Uh, you guys have a exciting thing going. I'm sure we'll get into some of that. But maybe if, if someone didn't know who uh, the Prefontaines were, maybe didn't know what you were up to, Nick, could you give us maybe the uh, the background of how you got into real estate? And then we're going to touch on some of the other parts of the story, I'm sure, a little later in the episode. Sure. How how all right. So let me first let me first fast forward into what we're doing today. So. We buy, we buy and sell on terms, so like rent own, owner financing, um, lease option, subject to that, like all things on terms like that with little or no money down. And our local, our local market, Dan, is uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. So we're doing deals in our business, but then also we have associates all over the country who we in essence partner up with and lock arms with and work with them in the trenches to basically do the same thing that we're doing in our small family business. Um, backing up though to how I got involved in real estate, I would say shortly, shortly after my accident, I think I was about uh, 14 or 15, I had got some interest in real estate. I started picking up some of my dad's books, Robert Kawasaki. That was that was really the main one I think that comes to mind, Dan. That was uh Cash Flow Quadrant. I remember I remember reading that and being fascinated by that when I was about fifteen years old. Going through that, I think that summer was heading into geez. Um Heading heading into my freshman year in high school, so I I actually was probably more like fourteen. Wow! So that was really that was really my start into just into real estate. I would say that I grew up in a real estate family. So all growing up, when I was when I was little, 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 um, my dad was a builder, had his own um, had his own company with a friend of his. Then after that, in the mid '90s, he transitioned into being a realtor, a broker owner at a, at a certain point after he got his feet under him. Um, then he sold to NRT. For those who are not familiar with that, NRT is the big company that owns Cobalt Banker and a couple of other firms. He sold to them in 2001. Then started doing some coaching of uh, real estate agents. And a few of his clients were up in Canada as well. And then he transitioned into being an investor and then back to being a realtor. So, I mean, really growing up, real estate was all I knew. Um, 
it's really it's really fascinating because growing up in that family, I would end up doing cleanouts of uh, rehabs and raise the roof projects that they were doing. Then even at one point in high school, they were my dad and his partners were the strategy that they were working was to uh, pre foreclosure leads back in oh five oh six which now legislation has come out, which is kind of restricting what you can do um, to target those people. But we were doing, we were doing it such that I was going and knocking on these people's doors. Shortly after getting my license, I was only 16 years old. So I would have a list of notice of defaults, people that I ever see notice of default from the bank. Um, Missed a few payments all the way up to like 10 or 12 payments and the bank still hadn't foreclosed yet. So I would meet with them first. I would go and knock on doors and then um, the select few that I got out of that, I would set up a meeting with the investor to come out and meet with them and see if we could help them. Uh, so that was, that was really my, I guess my, my start. That was that was my actual thought of doing something, and I was only 16 and 17 years old. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, just to fast forward, I mean, you are how old now? I am 30 years old. 30. And so you've been transitioned into the term stuff, and this is kind of like your full-time gig now, right? I mean, this is, you know, the family business. Yeah, correct. Correct. I actually got my, I don't know, I had an, I had an interesting journey. I actually got my real estate license shortly after I graduated high school in 2007. So I ended up getting it in March of 2008. Which, if any of you were around back then working in the real estate business back in early 2008, uh, you know that things later that year definitely changed. Um, so the market the market came down and that was the market crashed at that point crashed. Uh, my dad calls it, he refers to it as a debacle in his book. And he talks about that in his, uh, best selling book, real estate on your terms. But all I knew at that point, Dan was that market. So I, I didn't know all these other realtors around me were complaining about how the market how good it used to be and how it was terrible, but that's all I knew. So I I learned how to survive and sell in a in a less than perfect environment, I guess you could say. Then then after years of doing it, I think back in like end of 2014, my dad started doing buying and selling on terms. He asked me if I wanted to help him with the marketing. I I reluctantly I, it's kind of funny looking back at it now, but I reluctantly said, okay, I'll, I'll help you with some of the marketing because I was happy doing what I was doing. Uh, being a realtor, I was, I was making a great income. I, I really was thrilled being self-sufficient and being able to support myself and do my own thing being a realtor. So I was reluctant to join him. Then after I started doing the marketing, he needed some help with the buyers. So I said, well, okay, I guess I can help you a little bit with the buyers as long as I can do this right alongside my uh, realtor business, being, you know, being a real estate agent. By the end of 2015, January 2016, my income literally had flipped from making the majority of my money, my income as being a realtor and selling houses to the majority of my income being coming from working with my dad in uh, pre-property solutions. So then in uh, January 2016, I let my real estate license go and join my dad full time. And um, we've been doing it ever since. And actually, we focus a little bit more on the helping our associates all over the country do deals. So I actually work hand in hand with them uh, to to get a buyer and the whole buyer process once they have a property under contract. If that makes sense. 
Cool. Yeah. So let's go back in the story because I know that it was part of the impactful, certainly a, a life changing moment, I assume, for you. Uh, but you mentioned the accident briefly. Do you want to kind of expound on that a little bit, Nick? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. I did mention it briefly. I didn't come back to it. Um, yeah, I was actually back in 2003. I was in a snowboarding accident where it was a day. It was a day at ski club. And we we went to ski club on the bus there. We usually brought our stuff to get ready. So when I was getting ready, I noticed that I forgot one thing that I usually do bring to ski club. That's my helmet. I wow. didn't think anything would. I really didn't think anything would happen. I just thought I'd be careful, I'd be safe. You know, nothing was going to happen because nothing ever did happen. You know. Mm-hmm. Then we got to the mountain and headed straight to the top. And on the way to the top, we noticed that it was very icy. Uh, people were wiping out everywhere because it had been raining a little bit. Hmm. So then we got to the top and I wasn't, uh, it wasn't like my first, my, my first go around snowboarding. You know, I knew, I knew what I was doing. And, um, so I buckled in and, all gung ho because everyone was saying, "Oh, it'd be crazy to hit that jump, like the the biggest jump there. That that'd be nuts." So I was like, I took that almost as a challenge, and I went for the biggest jump with all my speed. And then going up to the jump, I caught the edge of my snowboard, which threw me off balance. Um, I was too close to the top to stop, so I was forced to go off the jump and. That was the last thing, Dan, that I that I really remember. Wow. I was told I was told later on um, that I landed on my head and I wasn't wearing a helmet. Eesh. And um, the doctors told my parents that even if I was to come out of the coma, that I probably wouldn't walk, um, talk, or eat again on my own ever again. Basically, be a vegetable. Jeez. So then after that, I was transported to UMass Med Center. Uh, because it was windy, they couldn't life flight me in, so they had to, they had to send an ambulance. And I guess I found this out after the fact, but there are only on a staff of like, of the EMTs, the, on the staff of like six to eight, there's only, there's only a few. There's only like um, I would say one or two who can intubate right on like right on the spot. And for any of your listeners who don't know what that is, that that's basically per- to to paralyze you. Um, so they had they had to do that. And luckily for me, um, the guy was on that night that did do that. So I was able to get intubated right on the spot. Then I got rushed to UMass Bed Center in Worcester, where I, that's where I was in the coma for three weeks. I really don't remember a month um, because it was a partially induced coma. Because they said if I came out of the coma, they thought I would have been out for about 10 days. But if I came out, I would have probably freaked out. And then, like, where am I? What happened? What's going on? And they didn't want that to happen because they didn't want the swelling in my brain to increase. I would have died at that point. So they had to kind of, they had to induce me uh, to get all my levels and so the swelling would go down in my brain. Then I would say about a month after my accident, maybe a little less, uh, Early March, I was transported to Franciscan Children's Hospital in Brighton. Uh, that's where I hit, that's where I learned how to do everything again, or started the started the process of doing everything again, of learning how to talk, um, how to swallow, simple simple things wow. like that 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 I'm sure a lot of people take for granted. Of course, and, and also walk um, and run. Um, because I ran out of the hospital, that was always my goal to run out of the hospital. <laughs> so I, I learned, nice. I learned how to run. I learned how to run. I did. I did achieve that. 
and uh, I had to learn how to talk again. So I had to learn everything all over again. So let me ask you this, Nick. I mean, at some point you come to and you're aware of what's going on. I don't know if that was three weeks in a day or a month in a day. It's really not the timing of it right there is not the important piece. But like, do you remember them saying things like, oh, they didn't know you're going to walk or like these like doubtful moments and inside before you can even get there? Did you like make a decision that you were going to run out of there? Like what was happening in your mind? Do you even remember where you like some this willpower to, you know, defy what the uh, doctors thought was going to be your reality for the rest of your life? Yeah. So to answer your question, uh, did I ever know that I was the kind of the prognosis was I wasn't going to be able to walk, talk, eat again? Uh, the an- the answer is no. I had no idea because. Around that time, remember how I said my dad sold his company, his brokerage, and then was doing coaching of real estate agents? It was around that time that he was doing coaching for real estate agents, and he was he was actually doing a lot of motivational speaking himself, uh, speaking at events on stage and coaching clients. So that was what he was doing. Uh, he had all, everywhere I looked, uh, around the ho- around the hospital room, he had sayings uh, printed out on uh, big what eight and a half by eleven pieces of paper. Well, that's, that's not a big piece of paper, but um, were block letters on those on those pages all around my hotel room. So everywhere I looked, I would only look at a positive, like a positive affirmation, a positive statement, like. With each step I take, I'm getting stronger and stronger. Um, every every breath I take, every step I take, I'm going closer and closer to my goals. And things like that, things about how, how I was going to return 100% to doing what I used to do, and that was my parents' focus the whole time I was in there, um, to get back get back to 100% and to do what I was doing. So I know I really had, I really had no idea because all I saw around me was like positive messages and, and positive affirmations. However, there was one time when I was in between therapies because when I, I mean, I don't think I touched on this, but I had to do physical occupational and speech therapy and not only did I have to do them every day on uh, Monday through Friday but I actually had to do them twice a day so I would do occupational physical and speech in the morning have lunch and then occupational physical and speech in the afternoons I remember one time after lunch I was sitting in my hospital room and I I was in a wheelchair at the time. I I couldn't walk and I I really could I couldn't really talk very loud or anything, but I remember just not necessarily being frustrated or anything, but I remember just kind of looking looking down at my legs and the wheelchair and then just kind of like what's what's going on and I looked up, I remember looking up at my mom and just saying like am I what's what's going on am I ever going to be able to walk again and she without even taking a breath without even hesitating one like quarter of a second she she said oh like yeah that that's what you're doing that's why you're here you're just getting that hmm. you're like getting everything back you're going to you're going to run, you're going to do everything again, just like you used to. And it was, it was actually right there that I was like, okay, um, this is just kind of a speed bump that I have to deal with in my life right now. But I am going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything just like I used to. And that, that was always my focus from that point on. Yeah, that's, uh, that's mind blowing that, uh, I can't even imagine it. I'm sure a lot of people listening can't even imagine having to, you know, face that, get through that, go through that. Um, one of my partners and I, Nick, we were talking 
uh, just a couple days ago. And one of the things that he seems to be attracted to when he's hiring people or when he's deciding to do business with people is a person who had to deal with, you know, some kind of giant challenge in their life and overcome that stuff um, in the past. You know, maybe it's uh, addiction and stuff like that. Like I've had to deal with that in my life and it, it was nowhere near as debilitating um, and challenging, I'm sure, that what you had to walk through, but it was enough for me to, you know, be outside the ordinary and certainly harken back to getting through that, knowing I overcame that, knowing I had to struggle with that. Um, and now it's become certainly when I look back at it, like kind of a foundation, a point of strength, like, hey, I overcame that. Um, so I can now overcome like this. We're just knocking on the doors of foreclosures. We're just making offers to sellers. We're borrowing some money to rehab houses. It's it's kind of like not this great mountain when you've had some kind of mountain in the past to overcome, um, you know, whether it's like what you just described or what I just described and my partner seems to gravitate toward that and he feels like it's almost like a requirement um, for someone to achieve at a high level. And I'm sure there's a lot of stories where people didn't have maybe that same level of adversity and everybody goes through things. But do you find that to be, Nick, like a strength? Is there times when you look back on that and it's like, hey, this here in front of me now is a joke compared to you know, in the after lunch, sitting in the wheelchair, asking mom if I'm going to walk again. And, you know, I ran out of there. There are times in your life where you're able to, like, apply that as a tool now that you've gone through that? Yeah, absolutely. And and I actually, I 100% agree with your partner's philosophy there. I mean, literally, if you're dealing, if you're dealing with someone who says they haven't encountered Anything they haven't encountered adversity, we say it all the time. They, they're hiding something because everyone that has achieved success, we talk about it all the time. Every, anyone who's ever achieved anything has, has had to overcome something. So, uh, I, yeah, 100% agree with you and your partner there on your hiring practice there. I would say, I would say the interesting thing is, it happened to me, my accident, when I was 14. So really, it was part of the, the doctors said that um, that if I was any older, and who knows this, because the doctors also said that I wouldn't be able to walk, talk, eat again. So who really who knows, but they, but they said that, that if I was any older, that I would have had a harder time recovering just because of... Uh, the young, the stage where my bones, like my body was still forming. Everything was, was forming. So I would say, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's sometimes, sometimes I get caught up, um, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you do or in any one of your listeners, you get, get caught up in the, the, the kind of the hustle bustle, the, this needs to be done now, kind of the, the urgency thing. And, it takes it takes a little bit to you can always rely on that strength that you had from going through your experience, but honestly, I I become so consumed in something, it's a good it's a good thing, but I have to sometimes just take a step back and take a deep breath and be like, oh okay, like this really isn't a big deal. No one's gonna die. It's really not that big of a deal. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it really puts things into perspective. I know even now I've had a great run uh, personally over the last five years. Um, I personally quit drinking. I think it was like seven plus years ago. It was 2012 in January. So like se mm -hmm. yeah, seven and a half years now. Um, and it, it's been, you know, ever brighter day up until this point. And yeah, sometimes still, Nick, uh, despite all the deals and, you know, the money's coming, the money's going, there's people rehabbing and there's, you know, a lot of people's lives who have been changed yeah. all along the way, but there's still those moments where it's like the ebb and flow of the spirit and it's like, I'm overwhelmed or I'm not getting the amount of results or this whole thing's going to come crashing in. And yeah, when you put it into perspective with, you know, for, for me, like hearing a story like yours, it's like, wow, geez, like I didn't have to go through anything like that. Like, wow, I just take it for granted that I could walk, talk, 
um, swallow, eat normal food, you know, and here it is. You had to earn all those things back. And I think that's, uh, that's, it's really, it's powerful. I mean, congratulations. Thank God. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm actually, um, I'm, I'm impressed by, by your story as well. And I'd like to, I'd like to hear more about your story, uh, for sure. Um, and like what you learned from it. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, I think that one of the things that I've taken away, so, you know, I think a lot of times people will get stuck in a cycle, especially with alcohol, you know, something that's like innocuous and it's uh, so acceptable and so mainstream and a part of our uh, environment here in the United States. It's a part of our culture at a deep level for a lot of people, not for everybody. But I think there's a, there's a certain number of people who are stuck in the obsession with it. And maybe it's just that, you know, oh, Friday night, I go out to the bar, to the club, whatever. Oh, on Thursday night, I have, uh, you know, a few drinks. That's, I, I'm not minimizing mine. Mine wasn't quite like that. Um, along the way, it was obviously a problem for me. But one thing I think that turned into a strength there for me, Nick, to be honest, it's like when I was able to sever that from my life, it created a hole. It created a place, right? A lot of times the hole is never filled if somebody tries and they're having an issue and they, they try to quit and they forget to like fill the hole in their life with something positive. You know, you have to have a new habit that comes in to break the old habit. And I had a, like a lot, yeah. I had a good network of people who had also done what I'd done. So instead of birds of a feather hanging around at the bar where people were drinking um, or having a certain friend group, I made an intentional effort to have a new habit of hanging out with people who were, you know, um, not drinking and making it a point not to drink. And this was like something we believed mm -hmm. in together. And at the time, um, you know, my real estate business was like in shambles when I had quit. It was nothing like it is today. And I had made the conscious attention to, uh, uh, you know, hang out with people who are doing real estate deals. And so like one lesson is um, birds of a feather, finding people who are doing what you want to do, getting around them, just like the associates are doing for you and you got, uh, you know, your company, Nick, and figuring out how mm -hmm. the deals are done, like the people in our podcast audience listening right now who are interested in real estate investing, um, you know, the different type of people that you're you're making a decision. Some people don't make a decision. They randomly, you know, go wherever and go to the same places. But I've learned to be intentional about that, um, to associate with the right people. I've learned to put in habits like exercise in place of other habits that didn't serve me that actually produce like, you know, maybe more health, maybe more longevity. There's research that says there's brain cell generation from exercise. And the last piece is that I took my obsession, right? It's like an obsession compulsion, kind of a disease, they say, alcoholism, addiction. You're so obsessed and, you know, in that habit. And I was able to, like, now that we removed that, I'm able to, like, apply this tool of my obsessive nature to things like reading, to things like marketing, to things like building my business, to things like moving from Philadelphia, where I lived in 2012, to Chicago in 2014 at the end, so that I could be, like, here for my daughter, who was 12 at the time, and see her on a regular basis for those last couple of years of, you know, before she heads off to college in another year or so. So I, I think mm -hmm. for me, it was definitely a redefinition of a lot of things that may have been, you know, negatives and drawback. Oh, this guy's like obsessive and finding a way to like apply some of those things. That's just part of who I am in a positive way yeah. to kind of like build myself up. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. You know, that actually that actually strikes uh, strikes a chord for me. I actually, yeah, I was I have a I have a similar similar drive and a similar personality that when I'm doing something, I I want to be doing I want to be the best at it. I want to be doing it the the most that I can. I don't want there to be anything else and that that's kind of that's kind of like that's kind of me that's kind of my personality so when snowboarding was taken away from me when i wasn't able to snowboard because i would literally 
we, I think the year of my accident, even though it was in February, that winter, I, there was a local hill a couple miles from my house. It was like a, a mountain. Not, it wasn't a mountain. It was a sad excuse of a mountain. It was a, literally a hill. Um, what they had, they have, they had a couple lifts and, um, a half pipe and things. I was there every single day from the day they opened, which was, and this is, this is strange that I remember this. The day they opened from, on November 23rd, and this is including, including holidays too. November 23rd, all the way, all the way to, uh, the day after Christmas. I would, I, I went there every single day. So to talk about, talk about how you can be obsessive about something, um, that was, that was prior to my accident. And I was an, I was an instructor. I was a snowboard instructor at the Hill in addition to snowboarding and hanging out with my friends and that kind of thing. But now to this day, I found another focus. I found another focus in a positive way and that's running. So in 2000, in 2015, I ran the, my first half marathon. Then in 2016, about eight months later, eight to nine months later, I ran in a 10 mile race and I'm actually training right now to run in a, another half marathon this year in October with Zach, my brother-in-law. So we're both doing that and, um, talk, talk about the, like the obsessive, the, the focus and focusing, focusing on something positive. That's all about that. So that, that actually, that, that's what, that's what your story brought up. The, that in me, what I'm going through. So cool. I like I like the hustle on that. So let's switch gears here and, and let's bring it back to uh, the real estate dealing with buyers um, that you are currently doing now. So in the last year, year and a half, two years after you made that transition from real estate agent income to uh, was it pre property solutions income. Um, I know that we, we've laid the groundwork on previous episodes for like how to do a terms deal and we focused a lot on the seller side of the transaction. But I yeah. personally know from my own success, Nick, that there's two halves to a transaction. Yeah, you gotta get the numbers right on the seller side. But if the property doesn't sell to someone else to take you out of that position, the deal's really not all that good and there's no profit on the table until you sell the property. So can we dive into maybe some of the things that you would tell these associates during coaching calls that would kind of like get them over the hill or like bring them through a scenario to get a buyer? Uh, we're just going to, we're just going to assume everyone knows that it, maybe they're a rent to own buyer already. But to get them committed on a property, maybe get more down payment out of them if there's some scripts or questions or processes that you could share that really would add some value to people listening. Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a particular process that I have to take or that we have to take all of our buyers through in order to maximize their um their down payment both up front and over time. There's a particular process that we have to take them through um in order to get that down payment. Like for example, I'll give you I'll give you literally you can't you can't get more real life than uh the buyer that we met we just met with today. Let me see, we just met with him an hour and a half ago for a property of ours that we that uh we bought on terms. So he his down payment is uh sixteen thousand eight hundred. The purchase price of the property that he's buying it for is one hundred and eighty four thousand. So that's a that's not quite ten percent over the course of his term. It's a two year lease, but it is it is up closer to the ten percent. Um, he is coming in with six thousand dollars down payment. In addition to that. He is doing three thousand dollars at uh with his tax return end of uh February two thousand twenty and then another three thousand the following year. 
end of February 2021. So altogether, all those things add up to 16,800. Now, I, you know, we didn't get that from just me on the first call with them, first time speaking with them saying, okay, do you have $16,800 to put down? <laughs> There's, there's, like I said, there's a particular process that we have to get these buyers through. So he originally called, and this was funny because I remember this very specifically about him. He originally called on a rental. He said, I'm calling, I'm calling about the house that you have for rent. So I, look, and, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you that that I call every single buyer, every single tenant buyer who says I'm calling about the house for rent, but there was just something about his voicemail to me that led me to believe that he, he number one, I mean, he had a brain. Um, he was calling about the house. <laughs> he had a brain. You, you can, you know what I mean? You can, you can, <laughs> I get it. it. Yeah. Someone, we, we all yeah, get it. I can, hear you, I can yeah. hear you chuckling on the other end. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I just, there was something about his voice. So to me, I called him back. I was like, Hey, um, so Dan, so Dan, you inquired about our rent to own property. Um, now that is, that is rent to own our rent to own program. And it's not a good fit for everyone. So before we get you in there, just do me a favor, have a look at the video that we have right on our homepage that goes over how our program works. And if it's still something that you're looking to do, you can give me a call back and, we can get you in there for a viewing. Now, he went away, didn't call me back for a few days. But then, again, like I said, I don't do this every time, but there was something about about him and just our conversation where I was like, all right, I'll, I'll, give, him, I'll give him one more call. Usually, I only call people, you know, once. But I was like, I'll follow up with was, him. Was there, so I followed up with Was there something – uh, about sorry to interrupt, but was there something about that he did, was it like he had a certain amount of income on the initial call? Did he like mention that he wanted to buy a property? Like what specifically did he say that was like a red flag that you're like, oh, this guy's probably worth you know the short hot list? Was there anything besides just uh, the tone of his voice? Like was any of the answers to your questions you know an indicator that he was going to be a strong candidate? There is usually there. There is usually I'm looking. I'm looking for based on our conversation. If the guy sounds like he's either a like for example he's a contractor or uh, like this guy was. This this guy was a contractor. He so you know the the fact that I like or we like contractors is because. So for the properties, we're turning over everything to them, and that includes responsibility for maintenance and repairs to the property. So there was something about just our conversation speaking with him. I got that he was a contractor. He'd been doing that for over 20 years. Um, so I just I just got a good sense from him, but it's either that. It's either, look, if they're handy I may give him another call. If we're having trouble moving a property, I may give him another call. Um, also, more or the most importantly, if if they have money, if if they if they write out say that they you know have money saved up for the down payment or, or they have X amount of dollars for the down payment or that kind of thing, then that might be someone I'd follow up with more. Yeah, that makes sense. Appreciate the clarification. Mm hmm. So you followed so up then, with him a second time there. Go ahead. Yeah, and then uh, he said, oh, I'm glad you called. I, I actually did get a chance to watch a video, and I'm interested. So then I set up his viewing, and as soon as I set up his viewing, I said to him, all right, so I'm going to take down your best email for you and get you a couple of forms over. If you're in, That way, if you're interested after you view it, if you're interested in taking the next step, all you would need to do is fill out those forms that I'm going to get you and send those back to me. Now, I think it might be obvious to you and everyone else that's listening that he did, he did give me the forms back on Monday, um, that he was interested in the home. I reached out to him yesterday and, uh, scheduled a buyer's meeting for this afternoon at 4.30. He came in, met with Zach and I, 
uh, went through a full buyer's meeting where we laid out all the terms of the agreement, what he's responsible for, what we are, that kind of thing. Um, and then we told him that with the first coming up on Monday, we'll probably be able to make a decision for him in the next few days or so uh, so we can get in there for the first. Was it part of the uh, documents he filled out? Was that an application basically sort of committing on landing on that property or what were the docs he filled out? Uh, that's a good question. It's just uh, his um, his income, like what he does for an income monthly, it's usually there's a couple different spots for applicants. It's usually household income to ask what the, what they have for income. And then in addition to the regular income, if they have other sources of income, they can list them there. This guy, this particular guy needs uh, 4400 a month um, for his day job. And that was actually conservative. After we met with him, he told us that was that was on the conservative end. But he also bartends under the table and makes $1,000 a month. The monthly on this is something like um, it's twelve twelve fifty a month. So we're usually looking for... Uh, his income, his monthly income to exceed three times whatever the rent is, just just for a baseline, just for a just for a comfort level for us that he can support the home and take care of it, just like he's the owner and he's not going to be calling us every time something happens to fix it. Yeah, that makes sense. I like how you guys position it to him, and I know a lot of landlords who are experienced also position this way. It's not like, hey, do you want the property? I mean. It, it, well, let me ask. I mean, I'm assuming the guy wanted the property, but was there uh, like an asking him or closing him on that property or was it kind of like a positioning tactic to uh, have him fill the paperwork out? He's sort of indicated by coming to see the property that when you went through the buyer meeting, you know, you're p posturing him back and saying, yeah, we we'll make our decision probably by the first, which is right now it's uh, six days away from where we are right now. Yeah, more realistically too, Dan, for this particular property, we, we've had that, we've had this on the rental market for, for a few months right now. So we were actually, if we're, we were thinking if we're not able to get a good rent to own buyer in there that, that we just rented, um, because this particular home we do own, um, we did buy it on terms, but we do own, um, so we are thinking if it got to like August one, we are probably just going to rent it. So that's why that's why we were more to accept the buyer closer to the or only a little over the three percent mark, which isn't usually our norm. Um, usually it's three to ten percent down, um, and it's usually probably closer to that that five to seven percent. Um, that range right there. It's not necessarily always just the minimum, but we were thinking that if we got to August 1st, then we, we might just rent this. So he was a great, uh, he was a great find that he stepped up. Gotcha. So that brings me back a second. This guy responded thinking he was renting a property. Is there a certain way that you're writing the ad and where are you placing ads for like these tenant buyers to potentially come in through the door? Are you mentioning these down payment requirements there or walk me through some of those details? Sure. So we advertise the property first. It's, it's basically just a regular description that you'll find about a property, but then we're inserting rent to own our in front of it because all the properties that we offer up through our rental home program we have equitable interest in so we are we're not talking out of school by saying rent to own our all the properties that that we have where we have equitable interest and we're selling on a rent to own so uh, we're placing that in the end and then we're also placing a 24-hour property information line which is going to Tell them, yeah, tell them a little bit about the house, but also it's going to say just what I what I said to you in my example that our well look our rental home program it's not a good fit for everyone it's not just a rental so before you go any further uh, when you have a look at our website we have a video on there that goes over how our rental home program works and if it's something that you're still looking to do just give me a call back and we can get you in there for a viewing. 
and actually by having by having that on my vote my um on the property information lines I'm actually getting um we do get a lot of hang ups which is fine which we we've automated the follow up in that we don't have to speak with every single hang up um we have a system for dealing with that as well yeah, this is brilliant, and I wouldn't expect anything less from you guys, having known Chris now for a couple of years, know what he's up to. But the the highlight for listeners, there's a huge emphasis on this uh, pre-marketing sequence, if you will, that's doing some of the sorting out up front so that you're not having to call back 25 hang-ups. You're only having to talk to what? The two or three people who listen to the message like, first of all, you know, where a person's saying, like you said earlier, where a person has a brain, you know, I'd rather have the ones that aren't listening and paying attention and aren't going to be capable. Just hang the phone up. Don't bother, you know, bothering us anymore. And if yeah. they had the patience to sit through and actually listen to this uh, recorded information and then maybe go and watch the video, where where is the video? Is that something that, you know, listeners could go check out if they wanted to? Is there an easily accessible URL or is it property specific? Uh, well, that video, that video, actually, all of our, all of our associates do get access to access and rights to all of our videos, our, um, our, you know, how does rent home work videos and also, they get, we also have, I didn't mention to you, but uh, we also have something called buyer Q&A videos. And anytime we get a repeated question asked to us over and over and over again, um, which I'm sure you've experienced, we're creating a, we've created a video for it, and those live on our website as well. Um, so we direct buyers there as well to check those out. Because we've we've already gone. If we get if we get a question over and over, we already we make a video um, instead of explain it every single time, so buyers can just go with their leisure and look at those videos. And we find that often once they once they do that, once they they spend some time on the website, or if they're skeptical and they spend some time on the website, they're a lot more comfortable in dealing with us because. They're not so guarded. They they realize that oh, like we're a legit company. We're not we're not trying to scam them out of money or that kind of thing. So once they get a comfort level, their their walls will come down. If that makes sense, they're a lot more open and honest with us. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you position yourself with credibility, and then somebody has spent some time. They realize that you're not uh, the, the shady rent-to-own operators that sometimes pop up in a market who are just trying to collect a deposit on a property they may not even own at all. So the more info you put in front of them, makes sense that the the better that they're going to feel about disclosing and then eventually handing over, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars and entering into this like long-term contract. So let me back yeah, up just exactly. a few moments here. Yeah. Um, Nick, we did a $184,000 sale price on this property that you were yeah. uh, going to collect roughly 16800 down and you're doing a two-year lease. Can you provide some details for me on that just so we have some background and some some color you guys said you own it we're not going to dive too much into the the terms on the deal but i do want to know how much was the purchase price on the property if it was something that was recent and how you structured the 184,000 like as an example you know is it, if this property were to sell in today's market based on the comps and the condition like how much would it actually sell for right now through real estate agents the old fashioned way compared to uh you know 184,000 in 2 years is there any appreciation kind of built into that to account for the market moving or some other way to structure it yeah, funny funny story about this particular property. We've we've controlled this property for gosh, I think like uh something something like four years now, I think. I'm I'm actually just pulling the um master property list on my desk. I'm just pulling that out and that has all the figures that you're asking me about on it. All the numbers, that kind of thing. Um this particular property, we did have it. We did have it on the market with the realtor we are trying to sell over the winter, and we were last at. I 
think we are last at um gosh, uh one fifty one fifty nine nine and that was I think that was as low as we got for that particular property and then we decided it didn't make any more didn't make sense anymore after we paid the realtor and everything. Um we I think our break even on it was probably like around uh one thirty or something like that. So we decided to do another rent to own on it. Um the rent to own, what were the questions that you had? I'm just trying to find that exact figure for you right now. So that what does, were the exact yeah, questions? That, that sheds light on it. So that was, you know, one one fifty nine and it actually didn't sell with a realtor, but let's just assume roughly it would appraise at like hundred and sixty thousand if you did end up finding a buyer for it then. So how did you how did the conversation with this new tenant buyer go? as maybe he is or maybe he's not aware of, you know, that it would appraise for, he could buy it for roughly 160 if he would have had his situation perfect right now. And how did you explain and set up the $184,000 sale price with that tenant buyer with those facts? Okay. Uh, let me, let me, let me just back up. Let me go back. The 19 dollar I did find it on the all master uh, property list. Yeah, it's roughly, our break even what the what the mortgage balance is at um right about now is about one thirty or one thirty three right about there, so after we couldn't find a buyer at that price of one fifty nine nine I think we the last offer that we got was literally a break even like we would make no money, we would just be able to exit the deal uh because we are getting low ball offers that kind of thing. We decided mm-hmm. to we decided to take it off the market. It's this is all kind of coming back to me now. So we decided to take it off the market, and when we took it off the market, we did we sent our team of contractors over there. They went through and painted the whole thing just because it was very dark, dark uh, wood, very dark wood. It made it look very claustrophobic, very um, dark and gloomy. Oh. We went through and had. Yeah, exactly. We went, we went through and had our contractors go in there and paint everything. So it brightened it up, of course. And we, we replaced the furnace. So there's a brand new furnace there. There, there's a few doors that are brand new. We did a, like, we spent some money, uh, doing these repairs. Probably like, I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm just like, uh, step in the dark here. About 10,000, I would say 10 or 12,000. Then we decided to put it out on the rent to own market for one eighty four nine and twelve fifty a month. When we put it out there, the thing the thing with the rent to own buyers, Dan, is they're not going to they're not gonna haggle with us on the purchase price. I mean because they're not able to get a loan today. So and the thing is, I'm not I'm not rubbing it in their face that if they ask me if if I can come down off that, I'm just always responding to an objection with a benefit. So it's it's something like this. And this this buyer, his name was George. He actually did ask me. He goes, Well, you know, I see you're at 184.9 that price. Is there any chance you can come down with it? And I said, Ah, gosh, George, the um. You know, the only the only way that we usually get into a conversation about lowering the purchase price is with a down payment of like over ten percent. Um you know, his down payment at that point, he had already got his forms to me is like, I don't know, three and a half or four percent. His initial down payment and then we got him up to sixteen thousand eight hundred over the course of his um uh, his agreement. But then once he understood that, that, uh, that, that price, you know, that's the only way that we negotiate on it. I was like, well, George, this, it's not a negative. I don't want you to look at it like that. You're actually, we're, we're finally in an appreciating market and values are rising anywhere from three to 8% per year, depending on which pocket of the market that you're in. Um, so whether it's going to take you 18 months, 24 months, or even 36 months to get your own loan. That price is remaining the same, the 184.9. Mm-hmm. 
so you're you're benefiting in that and also any improvements that you make to the property and any subsequent increase in equity uh you're keeping not us uh because you're locking that price in today you deserve that most people try to take that from you we don't we give you what you've earned so he did ask but most buyers don't even ask yeah that's solid that gold right there that uh that nails it. That's what I was looking for. Okay. All right. Good. I didn't. I didn't know just because there was there was a silence. So I was like, does, does that make <laughs> does that make sense? I'd like to. I'd yeah, like I, to Dan for for your uh, for your listeners. I'd like to uh, give away. We actually have a brand new book. Um, it's already an Amazon bestseller. It's my dad who was already an Amazon bestseller, and then it's also with uh, Zach. Beach, my brother-in-law, and myself. Um, it's called the new rules, the new rules of real estate. And your listeners can go to our website to get that for free. And when I say free, I don't mean they have to pay for shipping and handling. This is a hundred percent free. So if they go to visit a website, it's called newrulesforfree.com. Again, that's newrulesforfree.com. They can pick up a copy of the book for free. We'll send it out to them. Cool. Sounds good. We are uh, pretty much at the top of our hour here. I uh, I appreciate you coming on the show, Nick. I really enjoyed it, Dan. Thanks for having me. And thank you for tuning in to this episode of the REI Diamond Show. Keep an eye out for the next episode. Ian Walsh, a friend and hard money lender from Philadelphia, and myself discuss the reasons why many offers made on real estate deals just don't get accepted or even considered. Uh, Here's a clue. It's not always about the price. In fact, every week I and my team personally delete dozens of offers on our deals with reasonably acceptable prices But uh, my team and I never even considered taking them. Do you want to know the reasons why? You'll have to tune in to the next episode to find out. Now, are you interested in the pre-release of the next episode? That is, before the email goes out. When you subscribe on YouTube or one of the podcasting apps, including iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, you'll receive an advance notification as soon as episodes are published, as opposed to Saturday when the email is sent out. If you prefer the email, just head over to reidiamonds.com and sign up. Attention, deal makers. I am buying. I buy houses and apartment complex deals in Atlanta, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Florida. So if you have a deal, I prefer a deal that you are in direct contact with the seller, no daisy chains, please contact me directly using the form at reidiamonds.com. Or if you get my emails, you can just reply to that email as well. Are you an accredited investor interested in short-term passive mortgage investment opportunities with double-digit returns? Head over to fundrehabdeals.com to check out available high-yield investment opportunities. This is the end of this episode. Thank you again for tuning in to the REI Diamond Show. Dan Breslin here. Catch you on the next one. Thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin. To receive email notifications of new weekly episodes, sign up at www.reidiamonds.com.